Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Uh, we're going to let uh, everyone uh, take their virtual seats uh, for a few seconds, and uh, then we'll get started. Well, again, good afternoon. I'm Vincent Rougeau, the Dean of Boston College Law School, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the Rappaport Center for Law and Public Policy's first program of this academic year. The Rappaport Center has been at BC Law for five years. It's amazing how quickly the time goes. And in that time, the center has held many programs and conferences on important areas affecting communities, individuals, and society at large but few programs are as important as today's. It's been incredibly painful and challenging uh, these several months. We've continued to grapple with a global pandemic and we're still reeling from the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd and so many other black men and women. Violence is ripping cities apart and divisiveness throughout the country is rampant. There is much work to be done. At Boston College, in recognition of the urgency of racial justice work that must happen, the Forum of Racial Justice in America was created, and I'm delighted that Father Leahy, our president, has asked me to be the inaugural executive director of the Forum. And over the next several months, the Forum will be collaborating with students, faculty, staff, and community members to listen, learn, and embark on what will undoubtedly be challenging conversations but also opportunities for healing and for hope. Today, the Rappaport Center launches its year with a program squarely addressing racial justice, entitled Civil Rights and Criminal Justice, A Time of Reckoning. It brings together four particularly notable and passionate legal experts in the areas of civil rights and criminal justice. We're privileged to have all four of these individuals with us today but I will only introduce our esteemed moderator, the Honorable Geraldine Hines, and she will introduce the panelists. So let me tell you a little bit about Justice Jerry Hines. She was born in Scott, Mississippi, and grew up in the Mississippi Delta. She graduated from Tougaloo College in 1968 and the University of Wisconsin Law School in 1971. After law school, she moved to Massachusetts and began litigating in the area of prisoners' rights as a staff attorney at the Massachusetts Law Reform Institute. She then joined Roxbury Defenders, spending four years working in criminal justice, eventually becoming director of the committee. Combining action with academia, Justice Hines then went to MIT, where she was awarded a fellowship to research policy initiatives addressing the issue of police misconduct in communities of color. After MIT, she took a position at Harvard Center for Law and Education, where she litigated civil rights cases relating to discrimination in education and advised on special education law. In 1982, Justice Hines, with two other lawyers, founded the first law firm composed of women of color in, in New England. While in private practice, she continued to litigate civil rights cases, including employment discrimination and police misconduct claims as well as other types of cases, including criminal and family law matters. In 2001, Governor Paul Cellucci appointed her an Associate Justice of the, Supreme, of the Superior Court, excuse me. And in 2013, Governor Deval Patrick appointed her an Associate Justice of the Massachusetts Appeals Court. One year later, in an historic appointment, Justice Hines became the first African-American woman appointed to the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court. Justice Hines has been an active in a number of civic and community organizations, some of which include the American Civil Liberties Union, the National Lawyers Guild, and the National Conference of Black Lawyers. She has observed elections and investigated human rights abuses in Africa and in the Middle East. In 2018, Justice Hines served as the Rappaport Distinguished Visiting Professor here at Boston College Law School, and she now holds a visiting professorship at BC Law. I hope you'll enjoy this program from the Rappaport Center, and I hope that you will tune in for the other programs that we'll be offering throughout the year, 
It's our pleasure to welcome you today, and it is my pleasure and privilege to welcome a true pioneer, Justice Geraldine Hahn. Thank you, uh, Dean Rougeau, for that kind and generous uh, introduction. I consider it a privilege and an honor to be a part of this program, and I was delighted uh, when Lissy asked me to moderate the program, and I worked with Cindy and Lissy to help try to shape what we're going to do today. I am uh, really grateful to the Rappaport Center for Law and Public Policy for bringing us all together for this urgent conversation about the perils and possibilities of this moment in our country's history. When individually and collectively, we are grappling with the consequences of our failure as a country to atone for America's original sin and all that it has wrought. We have been here before, but we have been brought to this particular moment of reckoning by the shockingly brutal and senseless killing of George Floyd by police officers in Minneapolis. Anyone who resisted the urge to look away bore witness to an unspeakable cruelty. We know, of course, that police violence targeting Black people is as old as the country itself, and death at the hands of the police is a familiar trauma in Black communities and communities of color all over the country. But the brazen callousness, to say nothing of the brutality of the way in which those police officers snuffed out George Floyd's life, has forced us to confront head on this manifestation of institutional racism and the awful truth about the power of the police to kill and maim people of color with impunity. The protests of the police killings of Breonna Taylor, Rayshard Brooks, and others that have not caught the attention of the media in places all over the country suggest that people from all walks of life understand the corrupting influence of racism in our society. People have mobilized to demand change, not just in the criminal legal system, but in society more broadly. So in this moment, we seek to come to terms with how we got here, and in doing so, we are called upon to reassess what it means to be committed to civil rights and racial justice. Although the problem of institutional racism is complex and not amenable to a formulaic prescription for change, we can begin where we are now with just one aspect of this problem, asking whether and how the Floyd case has changed the struggle against racism in general and racist policing more particularly. We have three excellent panelists who are prepared to lead us in this conversation about a way forward. Anthony Benedetti is the Chief Counsel for the Committee for Public Counsel Services, CPCS, the Massachusetts Public Defender Office. CPCS provides legal representation to 285,000 indigent clients annually in criminal delinquency, family law, and mental health cases with a staff of 700 including 425 lawyers and 2,800 assigned private lawyers. Mr. Benedetti has been an adjunct professor in the Suffolk University Criminal Justice Sociology Program since 2002, teaching graduate and undergraduate courses in legal issues, criminal justice policy, child welfare, development of delinquency, and the introduction to criminal justice. Yvonne Espinosa Madrigal is the executive director of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, an organization founded at the request of President John F. Kennedy in the 1960s at the height of the civil rights movement. Under his leadership, the Lawyers Committee has become a hub of litigation and advocacy for racial justice. Yvonne has filed and won dozens of life-changing and law-changing cases on a wide range of civil rights issues, including immigrants' rights, LGBT, HIV equality, 
He clerked in the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit and the United, in the United States District Court for the Southern District of New York. He is a summa cum laude and Phi Beta Kappa graduate of the University of Pennsylvania. He received his Juris Doctor degree from New York University School of Law. Carol Rose is the Executive Director of the American Civil Liberties Union, a nonpartisan membership organization that uses litigation, legislation, communications, and people power to promote civil rights and defend civil liberties, including voting rights, racial justice, LGBTQ equality, women's rights and reproductive justice, freedom of speech, privacy, and equal protection. She is a lawyer and a journalist. She started her career as a reporter for the United Press International, then worked for the Des Moines Register and the New York Times with reporting stints in Washington, D.C., the Middle East, Japan, and South Asia. Upon returning to the U.S., she attended law school and worked as a civil rights lawyer. Under her leadership, the ACLU of Massachusetts has won historic legal and legislative victories in the area of criminal law reform, immigrants' rights, voting rights, and privacy. She is a graduate of Stanford University, the London School of Economics, and Harvard Law School. To begin with, each of the panelists will give brief opening remarks, after of which I will open the discussion with a series of questions to the panelists, <coughs> excuse me, questions that are intended to focus on three issues that might be helpful to advocates, activists, and people who just want to lend their voices to the demand for a humane and just approach to this problem. How do we build on this moment when the country may be receptive to change in the way we police? What is the Floyd case revealed about the kind of change we should be seeking in the way we police? And how do we accomplish that change? We will proceed with the panelists weighing in on each of these questions until 4.30, at which time we will invite questions from the audience. To ask a question, you should use the Q&A function in your Zoom app. I should add that this program is being recorded. So why don't we start with the opening uh, remarks. Mr. Benedetti. You're muted. <laughs> Thank you, Justice Hines, for that very kind introduction, and uh, Dean Rougeau and um, Lizzie Medvedeau for having this uh, panel discussion at a time when these issues are at the forefront of, of so much of what is going on in this state and in this country. Um, just that you gave a, a, a little bit of a background on what the Committee for Public Counsel does. And for those who aren't as familiar, I'll uh, give a little bit more detail. Uh, it's the state agency that's responsible for providing counsel uh, either to, to people who are unable to afford it, either because of um, they're entitled by statute or by the Constitution. And so it is a wide range of individuals who receive a wide range of services, everything from adult criminal delinquency, child welfare, uh, mental health, and a number of other areas. And for the most part, uh, the people who are caught up in this system are overwhelmingly poor, uh, and they are disproportionately people of color. Uh, and so we, we're going to get into this in a little more detail later, but simply put, whether it's uh, the education system, health, housing, economic opportunity. Uh, our society pushes these people, uh, primarily of color, out of the mainstream economy and social systems, uh, which are not offering appropriate solutions, and they end up in the courts. And so in many respects, uh, public defenders have been on the front lines of this uh, civil rights battle since the beginning. Uh, we see it daily. Uh, we see it in the legal system, in all of our practice areas. Uh, people who are uh, at the end of the line, government, society has failed them. Uh, they've been ignored, abused, downtrodden by the system instead of getting the services that they need, that they deserve uh, to succeed. Um, we see um, an experience in some respects alongside with them, uh, the violence of the system. 
Um, you mentioned uh, Mr. Floyd, and, and there's been so many other instances where uh, police brutality has been captured uh, on cell phones and, and body cameras. Uh, so there's been widespread documentation, uh, but despite that, it continues to happen. Um, no one can dispute that the culture of police uh, fails to reflect the communities uh, that they're intended to serve and this has to end. And so in terms of what CPCS is doing in the moment, uh, we continue to represent clients and we continue to do what we can to fight uh, for systemic change. Um, so we fight in individual cases and we fight um, system-wide. Um, and I would say what this moment has caused us to do is to reflect, to see what we can do to do a better job of advocating for our clients and more effectively interacting with our client communities. Uh, we have traditionally had a holistic model of representation uh, and we're recommitted to doing that. Every client needs zealous legal representation, but almost every client also needs advocacy for the opportunities, resources, and services that are available uh, outside the courthouse. And so um, I look forward to this conversation. And again, thank you for asking me to participate. Okay, <clears throat> Mr. Espinosa Madrigal. Thank you, uh, Justice Hines. Um, and please just call me Ivan. <laughs> Nobody really <Okay>. calls me <laughs> Mr. Espinosa Madrigal. Well, don't call me uh, Justice Hines then, okay? Well, Justice Hines, it is always a pleasure to see you and, and to be on a panel with you. Um, I also want to thank uh, Dean Rougeau for joining us um, and for convening us along with Lizzie and her team at the Rappaport Center. It's always a pleasure to connect with my colleagues, um, Carol and Anthony as well. Um, in terms of opening remarks, I want to give a couple of thoughts uh, building on what Anthony just described. Um, one is uh, Lawyers for Civil Rights, um, we represent Hope Coleman, the mother of Terrence Coleman. If you don't know about Terrence Coleman, Google him. Google him now so that you can see the articles related to how um, he was killed by Boston police. He is our very own George Floyd here in Boston. And so it makes it very clear that um, what we're talking about uh, from Minneapolis is not confined to those cities. Uh, we are not immune from the type of brutality and police um, misconduct uh, that has really been at the center of conversations about uh, Black Lives Matter. And so uh, Terrence Coleman, just to share an anecdote here, was a young Black man with a disability. And his mother called 911 requesting an ambulance to get him to the hospital. The ambulance arrived with a, uh, with a, uh, with a police cruiser and uh, in very short order, the police um, fatally shot Terrence Coleman. So a call that uh, started as a 911 request for emergency from Hope, from his mother, ended up um, having these fatal consequences, raising serious questions about how police and law enforcement interact with people in distress, interact with people of color, interact with people with disabilities. And these are things that don't go away. These are things that have tremendous consequences. And so these incidents involving George Floyd and Terrence Coleman are happening in communities around the country and force us to confront this reality. I also wanna just hit on two other points. In Massachusetts, we are one of the few states that does not have police decertification. As attorneys, if we do something wrong, we could get this barred. But as police officers in Massachusetts and several other states, including Alabama, that's the company we keep. Um, if you are a police officer and get fired for misconduct, you could be rehired in a police precinct down the street. So there is no way to keep a bad apple away from the bunch unless we have police certification and similar efforts, which I know many of my colleagues in this panel have been pushing for statewide, but this is something that merits our attention. What are we doing institutionally to hold police accountable? And I'll just close by saying that diversity in policing is critical. We cannot get through this without making sure that police departments look and feel the way our communities do. 
There was a hate crime in East Boston and we represented a mother and her child who were hate crimed right in the middle of East Boston, in Maverick Square. And when the cops arrived at the scene, she wasn't able to communicate with the cops because they didn't speak Spanish. I'm not saying that every cop needs to speak Spanish, but if you're patrolling a primarily Latino, Spanish-speaking community, it behooves all of us to have people on the ground who could really make a connection with victims. And this isn't just about speaking Spanish. I'm talking about diversity in all of its forms, racial, gender, and neighborhood-based, so that we can have a police force that is attuned to the needs of the community. Thank you. Carol? Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. It's so, uh, such an honor to be here. I actually feel quite humbled uh, and grateful that you all are creating this safe space for have, us to have a conversation um, with two of my favorite colleagues and, and Justice Hines. I'm going to call you Justice Hines, Jerry, <laughs> throughout. Um, and, and, and Lucy, Dan, and, and Vince, thanks too. Um, and especially thanks to all of you who are out here. Um, I, I was saying before uh, we went live that I was so impressed. I went and looked at the all the fellows bios this year and last and before and I'm so impressed. And so I'm really honored because y'all are the future leaders of the Commonwealth and of the country. Um, and so I'm, I'm really happy to be here. And I'm really grateful for the opportunity uh, to participate. Um, so a lot of people have heard of the ACLU, but I'm not sure they know quite what we do. So I'll be real brief. So we have sort of the secret sauce on a couple levels. One is that we're one of 50 state affiliates. So there's like a network of ACLU offices around the country. We're all independent and yet affiliated. So we work really well together. So thinking in terms of the local action and the national action is big. Um, we work on lots of different issues, um, you know, racial justice and criminal law reform, uh, rights of immigrants, human rights of immigrants and keeping families and children together. We've been doing huge amounts of work on that. Um, voting rights is a huge priority. We work a lot with Yvonne on that. Uh, and, and the Voting Rights Coalition. We work with Anthony on drug law reform and criminal law reform and sentencing reform. So, so the ACLU works on lots of issues and as a result, we're sort of forced to think about the intersectionality of them, right? And, and, and what is the relationship? So there's the historic relationship of race in this country that Justice Hines referred to. And then there's the uh, current day, the interrelationship of the various uh, groups and interest groups out there and can we bring them together in movement building for social justice and for social change. Um, and so I think those are sort of our, and then the third is the integrated advocacy. So we're a membership organization. Our money comes from people being, you know, $20 card carrying members of the ACLU. Um, and as a result, we're able to mobilize a lot of people to take action. Um, and that's where all of you come in because I guess my big, um, I'll start with where I probably should end. My big takeaway is you know, we're at a choice point, um, not a turning point, but a choice point. Uh, we have choices that we can make as a people, as a country, as individuals, as a commonwealth about what we're gonna do right now. Um, and I don't think we can say we can count on uh, the arc of justice to turn for us. People did that before us and it's up to us to do it today and figure out how we're gonna bring the forces of justice together right now uh, both in terms of uh, tr a peaceful transition of power this fall and leading into the, into the coming year, and then thinking about the role of race, which has become so uh, painful yet again, and, and such a big part of the conversation. But I will just also say I have a lot of hope. And the reason I have hope is because we're having the public conversation. We're having it here today, but we're having it across the country. Um, and there are people who are spending huge amounts of time in, in promoting new ways to think about it. You know, whether we're talking about the racism, anti-racism lens of Ibrahim Kendi, or whether we're talking about caste, you know, Isabel Wilkerson's frame, um, Black Lives Matter is a frame. You know, and they who set the frame win the game. So let's set a frame together and let's make sure that we take on these really hard issues that we're gonna be talking about today. And again, I'm just really honored and humbled to be here. Thanks. Okay, so I will just start with, with this question. I think it's been uh, invigorating and encouraging uh, to see the, the protests that have gone on uh, across the country over the last couple of months. But uh, I think we've also seen and in the recent time, uh, pushback, violent pushback. Uh, whereas before the pushback was from state actors when John Lewis was clubbed coming off the Edmund Pettus Bridge, that was the state 
actor. Here we have private actors, private vigilantes who are engaging with Black Lives Matter protesters and other protesters. And I want to start our conversation by asking whether you think uh, this moment represents a turning point in what we're able to do about the pressing issue of race, or do you think that the pushback from the right and uh, quite frankly, the retrenchment of, of some people in their support of Black Lives Matter, I've, I've just seen some recent polls uh, released today that suggest that the support for Black Lives Matter is not what it was when the movement first started a few months ago. So I would like each of you to kind of just weigh in on where you think we are in this moment. Is, is, this, is this the beginning of something uh, important and powerful? Or are we gonna be stymied by that pushback that we've seen, the, the killing of the two people in, in Kenosha, Wisconsin and the like? Carol, why don't we start with you? Yeah, thank you. No, it's a really um, important question to talk about um, where we stand right now, because we had a lot of momentum in the public arena coming after the death and the, and the public viewing of the murder of, uh, of George Floyd. So, um, or the killing of George Floyd, I should say. And um, now we have dangers in sort of two fronts. So on one side, we're talking about sort of armed vigilantes, right? And um, I think, and I, by the way, I'm so glad you didn't call them malicious. I don't want to call them malicious. Militia gives them credence. And I think, I was thinking gangs, but I guess vigilantes is better. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> just saying, uh, and that's a real threat. And I don't know how much of a threat it is here in Massachusetts, but it is a threat. And as I talked to my fellow ACLU leaders in other states, there's a lot of fear around that, especially where people have open carry of arms. Um, and so how do you respond to that? What, what happens to my First Amendment rights when, they, when my First Amendment rights run into your Second Amendment arms, right? So I think there's going to be some really serious conversations about um, that kind of pushback. That's just real fear. But I want to focus here in Massachusetts um, on the leadership and what's happening here in Massachusetts because there's different kinds of pushback that are taking place. So in the police overhaul bill that the ACLU and other groups have put forward in the, in the legislature, and there's a Senate version, and there's a House version, and then Governor Baker has a version. And there's sort of three big things about it. One would be the decertification that Yvonne talked about, uh, which was Governor Baker's idea. That's important, but it's not <laughs> sufficient. That wouldn't be in and of itself enough because they had that in Minneapolis uh, and didn't do any good out there, right? So I don't think that's a, that's a necessary but not sufficient step. You know, there's a use of force uh, portion that's going in to, that would put limits on things like choke holes and tear gas, and that's good, but again, not going to the root causes. And then there's a qualified immunity provision, which we can talk about later, but it's holding up a lot of things. And what's so interesting about it is that the police unions are so powerfully pushing back. They're buying six-figure ads in the Boston Globe. They're they're having they had a, a, a they had their uh, campaign to have their wives and mothers call and say, "Don't take away my house." To their state legislatures, there's nothing in there that would take away their house. That's that's just not true. It's just not true. But it is so mobilized, and so we're seeing it play out right now whether we're going to have the courage of our convictions in Massachusetts, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, with the legislature of people who are overwhelmingly white and sit in power, are they going to use it to actually dismantle some of the power at this moment or not? And I think it behooves all of us to get involved in this campaign, because I think it will be defining for the Commonwealth for many years to come. And we can talk about, talk about it more, but I do think that that's the fierce urgency of this moment, things we can do here, even as we worry about what's happening in Texas and other places. <clears throat> I, I follow up on that point that Carol just made. Um, I, I'm glad, Justice Hines, you, you, you started the question by talking about the pushback from, from the right and, and a lot of the photos and the media are showing the extreme right clearly and the violence that is being perpetrated um, by those people. But um, it's not just the right, it's um, moderates and liberals who helped to get us where we are today. Um, we have a long history, as everyone knows, of systemic racism and, and, and people from all perspective, political perspective, have helped to contribute to it. But in terms of some of the challenges, um, Carol talked about the various legislative pieces that are floating around at the Statehouse. Um, 
I think most people don't understand the scope of the problem. Um, they see George Floyd and others murdered, um, but I don't think they truly believe that, that what goes on day to day uh, in terms of how communities of color are policed um, happens. Um, I think you, your opinion about the police comes from your reality. Uh, it's, it's informed by your experience with the police. So if, and the media. So if you live in, a, in a, a wealthy suburb, you're not experiencing the police the same way people of color are experiencing it in the inner city. So to you, the problem isn't um, what, what um, others are saying it is. And so you don't have the, um, you're not gonna spend as much time weighing in on these issues with your elected officials because you don't think it's as big as a pro of a problem as others do. And so um, I think Carol and maybe Carol Inavon both said this at the beginning. Um, that means there needs to be more and more education about the reality of policing in, in not just Massachusetts, but this country. Yeah, I, I fully agree with, with Anthony and Carol that none of these pieces are uh, a silver bullet. It really is holistic, comprehensive, and systemic reform that's going to get uh, to get us through this. And I did want to touch on precisely what you what you asked, uh, Justice Hines. Um, and, and I and I keep remembering Angela Davis's um, uh, really excellent quote about how in a racist society it is not enough to be non-racist; we must be anti-racist. And I think that's so important for the conversation we're having here. There are a lot of people who think, well, you know, I have no dog in that fight. You know, I didn't wake up today racist, or I'm not going to discriminate against anybody today before the end of the day. So it's kind of like a pat in the back, like I didn't hate crime anyone. I didn't discriminate anyone. But that's not what racism and systemic racism is about. I'm glad that you, in your individual capacity, are going through your day without harboring ill intent. But what are you doing to create an environment that, that promotes anti-racist conduct, right? It's not just being non-racist individually. It's about being anti-racist collectively. And I think that that's where we are losing the, uh, the hook. That's where we are really experiencing that, um, what you were calling pushback, um, I think it's not just a pushback. And obviously we see the pushback, but I think there are just people who are in the sidelines thinking this doesn't concern me and I really don't have to get involved. And it's to people like that, that when I have these conversations, I say, it is up to each of us to be changing this. You know, if I'm driving down the road and I see a black man in distress, <clears throat> I shouldn't just be driving by. I should be stopping to examine and see what's going on. If there are people of color being stopped on the street, you know, we all have a cell phone, or most of us do. Like, use it. Record. You know, take note of what's happening. You know, if you see something, say something. Those are little steps that each of us can do. But for so many of us, we find ourselves disconnected from that nexus of activity. Um, and I think a lot of that is just um, this sense that, that fighting racism doesn't belong to us, that that's somebody else's job. Well, sure, it's the job of lawyers for civil rights, it's the job of the ACLU, and it's the job of CPCS, and of the Rappaport Center, and of so many other people, but it's also your job. And that is an obligation that you have individually. And I think that's a lot of the disconnect that we see from the moderates, from the left, uh, let alone, you know, let's not even get started on the fringe right wing elements that are just bluntly racist. And nobody checks them. Nobody says, you can't say that, or you can't do that, even though we all have those people in our families. And it really is up to us to say, that's not acceptable, and to draw the line. Okay. Uh, okay, well, assuming that everybody who's working on this is has got a plan for keeping everybody in the fold who came into the fold post George Floyd. So what are we gonna do with the people who support 
this movement for, for anti-racism and for non-racial uh, policing. I mean, what does change in this moment look like to you? You know, there's this tension between the people who say, we can solve this with training, we can solve this with reforms, we can solve this with um, elimination of qualified immunity for police officers. And then on the other side of that, there are the abolitionists who uh, tout a root and branch kind of transformation of policing. I'm borrowing that term from uh, the segregation era when uh, uh, Justice Marshall, I think, was, was the person who said that we've got to eliminate this root and branch. So where, where should we be coming out on this? Uh, is it reform? Does reform make sense in this time? Or should we be aligning ourselves in any way with the people who want this root and branch transformation of policing? Um, Yvonne, why don't we start with you on that? You know, my organization also represents Black, Latino, and Asian cops when they're being discriminated in police departments. And so we come at this from a position of both suing the police department when they do something wrong, and then defending police officers when they are the victims of discrimination and racism. Some of our work, for example, was representing two black cops who were, um, who were discriminated in the city of Brookline, which is a suburb of Boston. Um, and we continue to do a lot of this type of work. Um, so I think for me, and, and not just for me in terms of, uh, I'm not just saying this wearing an LCR, a Lawyers for Civil Rights hat, I think this is a very complex and nuanced conversation that just does not lend itself to a blunt abolitionist approach. I think there are legitimate issues. You know, in conversations with Boston Public Schools, for example, when we started pushing uh, for uh, police to get off campus, there were some really legitimate concerns, not just from school officials, but from parents who say, you know, whether we want to, to talk about this publicly or not, or whether it makes headlines or not, there are still kids who come, up, who come to school with guns. There are kids who get sexually assaulted in schools. And so this idea that we're gonna remove police from campuses and that that's going to solve everything and we're gonna be all Norman Rockwell just doesn't quite jive with the reality on the ground. And so, you know, if you ask me, I want a police department that's not going to show up guns blazing to Hope Coleman's house when she calls for an ambulance. I want a police department who is going to be able to take complaints from civilians um, and not just send them away, shoo them away and say, come back when you speak English. Um, I want a police department who's going to treat people with respect and who's going to not just treat civilians with respect, but treat other police officers who are diverse within the force with respect and dignity too. And I think that requires reform, extensive reform. But I don't think that abolition is where we go. I don't think it's about eliminating and defunding police. I think it's about right-sizing the scope of the functions, right-sizing the scope of the budget to steer us away from militarization and steer us towards community policing. So um, I know that those views might seem conservative even, but, but I think they're grounded on very pragmatic and very practical uh, observations um, and the reality that I'm just not sure that abolition is viable, both politically or otherwise. Well, Anthony, what do you, th what do you think? I, um, I agree with Yvonne. Um, I think it was Congresswoman uh, Ocasio-Cortez who said when asked, what, what do you see uh, the future look like with police reform? And she said, it looks like the suburbs. It looks like how the police um, conduct their business in the suburbs. Yvonne referred to militarization and we've all seen um, pictures of how different the police look in an urban setting than they do in a, um, a wealthy 
uh, community. Um, I think um, the answer in some respects is easy. Implementation a completely, uh, is a completely different story, but um, more than 50 years ago, um, President Johnson asked a commission, the Kerner Commission, to take a look at what was causing all of the riots uh, in urban areas across the country. Um, and they recommended that it was poverty and institutional racism that was really the main root cause. Um, they talked about bad policing practices, a bad uh, flawed justice system, um, bad credit practices, poor or inadequate housing, um, lack of jobs, voter suppression, and we can go on and on with the different forms of racial discrimination. Um, and that the response to the violence, which was uh, inadequate police methods, police not being trained on how to go in and, and appropriately um, handle what was going on and bringing in the National Guard actually made things worse and added to the violence. So what happens? Uh, Johnson doesn't like the findings, doesn't follow them, and in part, in part, it was um, in response to white backlash, people who didn't like hearing that racism was one of the primary causes of what was going on. And so um, he doesn't do what the Kerner Commission recommends, and it eventually leads to this war on crime that pr was promoted by Nixon, which as we all know, has really turned into criminalization of poverty uh, and mass incarceration. And so um, in some respects, let's go back and reread that Kerner Commission report um, and, and, and start in, uh, take their recommendations and start investing um, in people and in communities. Carol? Yeah, um, so this is one of those dialectics, right? Uh, I think I think we need to do a both and. Um, you know, I've been doing a lot of reading lately around Reconstruction and Eric Foner's fabulous uh, history of Reconstruction, uh, and, and really sort of <coughs> then the history of the police and the relationship between policing and the Fugitive Slave Act, um, and all sorts of things. So, um, you know, gee, if I look back in history, I'd rather be William Lloyd Garrison. <laughs> Than anybody else, right? On the other hand, that's not the ACLU's official policy. Is not, we don't have one on abolition for or against. But I do think we need to think about what our North Star is as we do the work of the, the what are we going to do in the meantime? And there is real tension between uh, making sure that we will obviously represent our clients in court, that we have to put their interests first uh, and foremost. So just as an example, do you build more prisons so people can be closer to their families or do you have fewer prisons so that you just are more abolitionists? So there's real tension in these conversations. But for the most part, I think we have to do both. So we try to mitigate the harm and protect people as best we can um, through, you know, uh, uh, things like passing laws on qualified immunity uh, and police certification and use of force. Those are mitigations. But I think it's important that as we do that work that we keep our eye on the prize of the world that we want to actually live in and build. And I just think police violence cannot be effectively addressed without a complete reimagining you know, of the role of police. Um, and I think that has to be a, a significant reduction in their role and responsibilities and the presence in, their law, in our lives and in our children's lives and schools and things like that in places that are being heavily policed. And then at the same time, an investment, a reimagining, a reinvestment in more social workers and after school programs and uh, jobs and all of the, you know, all the other things that we're talking about that the Kerner Commission, you know, talked about. Um, and, and making that shift, and it's about dollars and cents. It actually matters. I mean, you have to actually track where the money goes because that's where the power goes, right? Um, and so I think we need to divest from systems that hurt our communities and invest into alternative strategies. And again, that goes back to agency. We can do it. We live in a commonwealth. We all have a right to be policymakers together. And we can, if we uh, work together, we can actually make changes. Um, as, frustrating, as frustrating as it is in the state legislature at times, that is a place that we can actually change the law. So the courts are really important. And who's in the courts? Can I just say one other thing that it really matters who's in the courts? I mean, Justice Hines, I'll just say one of the many reasons she's a hero to so many of us, me included, is a, is a decision that she penned that was unanimously supported, the Warren decision. And I'll misstate it, so you're going to have to say it for me, sort of the finding. Um, but things like that, it matters who's on the bench. It matters who's in the legislature. It matters who's on city council and in your town hall. It matters if we all get engaged. We can have a a strong civil society and civic society 
and that is really important to fighting racism. But Justice Hines, can you tell everybody about the, the Warren case briefly so I don't misstate it? No, it it's just says that uh, running from the police can't be evidence of guilt, that you've done anything wrong because in a city like Boston where the police are stopping you all the time for no reason, you run to protect your dignity, uh, to avoid being subjected to something like that. Well, let me just pick up where, where everybody seems to be on this reform. I'm, I'm not advocating for abolition, but I just want to think about the George Floyd case in terms of some of the, some of the reform approaches that I have seen, uh, the, the certifications, the training. I mean, what would have made a difference? What, what can we do now that would have made a difference in the way that police officer treated George Floyd on the street. What, what, would have, what would have made it different? What would have made that turn out to be not a murder in front of everybody with careless, callousness? How would, how would we apply a reform approach to something like that? If I may. Oh, please, Anthony. No, I, well, I was just going to say, I, I, I don't think you're referring to the fact that this police officer um, had a, a number of disciplinary complaints and nothing was ever done to him. No, no, no. I'm, I'm talking about as a person, how do we reform policing in a way that a police officer doesn't treat another human being the way what would have happened if if we had imposed some of the reforms that people are talking about uh, would it have made a difference carol yeah i think it would have i mean he had 17 citations against him through from and he still wasn't okay. so one is a, a decertification system that actually has teeth so you know i think we're i'm we're in favor of a certification system if you need it to be a, you know run a nail salon you should need it to carry a gun and a badge um you know you need a license to practice um and you should lose it if you don't so there was something wrong with their certification program so okay. the, in the details and then a change on qualified immunity so i mean qualified immunity is a, is a judicial construct uh, that basically says that it shields police officers from liability uh, for their wrongful conduct unless there's a, another court has found a case right on point exactly that was with a nearly identical conduct because otherwise the police aren't assumed to know that what they're doing is wrong so when they you know put somebody in a, in a cell covered in feces the average person would know that's wrong but apparently not a police officer because there's no case on point Right, it's that kind of stuff and it becomes a catch-22 because there'll never be a case on point because they all get dismissed by qualified immunity. So the bill that we have in Massachusetts would actually uh, limit qualified immunity uh, in ways that would, it, on the Massachusetts Civil Rights Act. So people whose rights are violated by police officers, let's say they, let's say they, there's a house worth of damage, right? And they say, I wanna be able to sue and, and get medical care or re repair the property that you damaged with your no-knock warrant or those kinds of things. But now they can't go into court, they can't sue, they can't get that liability, um, that restitution. So the risk of that misbehavior falls 100% on the victim, 100% on the victim, right? And we think it should be shifted to the police in the cities and towns that hire and train them because then they'll have an incentive to train them better, right? So we want to sort of move in that direction to see that kind of reform. And I'd like to, I think if, and, and then at the federal level, uh, Ayanna Presley and others have put forward a bill that would actually uh, ban qualified immunity at the federal level. I don't know what the situation is in Minneapolis, but I know they don't, they haven't passed qualified immunity limits because only Colorado has done that. Uh, so maybe that would have prevented George Floyd's death, maybe getting rid of, getting, getting that bad cop out of there. Just I agree fully with what Carol is saying. I think it's, it's that combination of, of um, strategies, because again, there's really no silver bullet. And I think the ones that Carol just identified for us are very rich and relevant. I would add just one additional one, um, uh, building on what Carol just laid out, which is, I, I think we also need to re-examine um, 
and, and it's done through these legislative and policy changes and trainings, of course, but, uh, but ultimately we need to be talking about culture change. How do you change the culture of policing and patrolling, um, especially in communities of color? Um, and even one step from that, um, uh, there was a phone call made to Minneapolis police, which got the police on that site, right? Somebody called the cops on this black man. And so that is something that we need to be thinking about collectively as a society outside of the police department. Um, somebody called the cops on him, just like they've called the cops on so many other uh, black people. And we've all seen many of these viral videos like the Central Park uh, bird watcher and among others. It's instances where interactions are being improperly escalated to the police. And so that concerns me because that's not something you could change just by training the police. It's something that we as, as, as a society, we need to stop resorting to calling 911 uh, when we see somebody who's black and we automatically think that they're dangerous or suspicious. That is a habit that needs to be broken so that we can stop placing people on this pipeline, not just for incarceration, but death. And so a lot of what, what we're talking about here goes also beyond the, the four walls of the police station or beyond the parameters of that training, even though I fully agree with everything that Carol's talking about. We need each one of those pieces. But I think we also need to have a conversation about what is an appropriate use of police, period. And that conversation happens in our own homes, in our own dining room tables, and in classrooms where we can start talking about this. I think that makes a lot of sense that part of the problem is rethinking the role of police in our society so that people like Amy Cooper have full confidence that if she picks up her phone and she calls the police, she knows what is supposed to happen with that and she knows why the police are there. And I, I agree with that. Uh, we only have a few minutes left. So I wanted to, to get everybody, all of you lawyers, and I wanted to get you talking a little bit about the law as the, the role of the law in what happens on the streets. I don't know if, if you follow our Fourth Amendment jurisprudence, but you know this, this uh, United States versus Wren case, which read uh, race out of the interpretation of the Fourth Amendment, it's okay for police officers to uh, do pretextual stops of black people as long as they have another legitimate reason for stopping them. And uh, of course, we've, we've touched on qualified immunity a little bit. I wanted to, to get you to talk just for a few minutes about what you think about the law itself as a means of addressing some of the accountability issues that we have with the police. There, there, I assume that there are a lot of law students uh, in this audience who who are going to be motivated to, to go into civil rights practice. And uh, uh, they want to know that, that, that there's, there's hope, that there's a role for them to play in the law. What's your take on where we are with the law as a way of dealing with this institutional racism in policing? OK. Um, I, I think we would all say certainly the law um, is a tool um, and it's an imperfect tool, um, but we all utilize it and we've all been successful um, utilizing it in a number of areas. But um, I don't know if this is answering your, your question, but it's not, it's not the answer to everything. Like, like we, have, um, we have already said, you need to do much more uh, then bring litigation. It's, it's you're bringing, uh, we represent clients one case at a time. We bring impact litigation designed to tackle systemic problems. That can be challenging. Um, one example of that is it, to, to address some of these systemic problems, you need data. In Massachusetts, data is not collected 
um, in, in any, any way that you would, you would call perfect. Um, it's hard to get. Um, some of it is not public. So, uh, so litigation, systemic litigation can be very challenging. Uh, but in addition to bringing, um, using the courts, we've mentioned policy advocacy, both locally and nationally. It, it matters who your elected officials are. A grassroots, grassroots advocacy to get people engaged in the political system. Um, there needs to be education and, and empowerment of the public, um, including and especially uh, the communities who are most affected. There needs to be education of the media. Um, I think the media is a is is it, it can be extremely helpful. They write a lot of stories that bring light to to issues, but then at the same time they write stories that don't provide context. And so for people who are reading a story or watching a, a news story, they're not really getting the full flavor of what the issue is. And, and to me, the mo one of the most recent examples is the Globe did a bunch of stories on bail um, and the challenges with bail and dangerousness. And the story did not really provide any uh, real context. They later editorialized and I think they got it right. But for the people who just read that story, um, they're not really getting what 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 bail is for and how it's supposed to be used. So, so that's a long answer to your question. Yes, yeah. you do need to use the courts, but it cannot just be the courts. Okay, that that's a good piece of advice for aspiring lawyers. Uh, okay, the last question I want to ask before we get to the Q and A is if you could just weigh in briefly on what you think uh, is the most significant obstacle to um, making some of the changes that you've been talking about, some of the changes that you think need to happen. What, what do you see as, as, as the big problem out there? I know you've talked about police unions and I've seen the, the full page ad, ads in the Globe the last three Sundays running, I guess. Uh, so, you know, police unions are, are an issue. What are the other kinds of things that advocates and activists who want to get engaged with this problem um, should be thinking about as obstacles to making change? One major problem is that we have this um, incredible misconception of being progressive Massachusetts, that we are doing things better than other states. And that leads to tremendous hurdles in getting some of the legislative pieces done that Carol was alluding to. Um, it shouldn't take that much effort to get some of these things done. Some of these are low hanging fruit. And even in a state legislature controlled by Democrats in both houses, we are unable to push through much of the even basic reforms that we've been talking about here, even in the aftermath of George Floyd's murder. And so I think there is a political inaction that is deeply problematic and that is embedded in our culture in Massachusetts. You know, um, that's part of the reason why a lot of our work focuses on litigation because that's something we can actively lead and do. And so piggybacking off what you were saying, Justice Hines, um, we want lawyers to be thinking about having an active role in this space to make up for that gap in, in the absence of legislative solutions, in the absence of other more systemic solutions, we can sure as hell sue police department by police department every time they do something wrong to a person of color. And that's what we intend to do at Lawyers for Civil Rights. Okay. Anybody else want to weigh yeah, in before I we... Uh, okay. I just want to say, like, for the record, like, I love the law. <laughs> <laughs> But at the same time, you know, the white man's tool, not dismantle the white man's house, says Audre Lorde. So, you know, we have to keep that tension in mind. But I, I really feel that law is a great field to be in. And I encourage your students um, and people who are interested to pursue it because it is such a powerful tool and you can wield it in, ma in many ways, but not alone. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, the, the, I always think about the, the, the movements that come. The, the courts are naturally fairly conservative. So they, they're not the beginning of the sentence in your campaign. They're the exclamation point at the end. So whether we're talking about equal marriage, right? I mean, we want it 
in, in local places, you know, one of her foster care. We want it, you know, and slowly we built a movement, but it was 20 years, same with transgender equal rights. And, and so these things take much longer. You have to be in for the long game, right? And then at the end, the courts and the legislature, they, they ratify the change that's already changed in society. So we need to do the change in society through the stuff that, that Yvonne and Anthony and, and Jerry were talking about, about changing the conversation. But then we need to also have the policy frame that comes behind it, right? And, and, and so we have to work in the legislatures and work in the courts and, and constantly work all the tools at our disposal in the press and educating the media. You're so right, Anthony, on that. Um, so I'm actually really hopeful, and I think when you think about a, a, a whatever, whether you become a lawyer or a teacher or a, you know, a healthcare worker, whatever you do, there's a space for you to be a part of this. It isn't limited to the lawyers. We need the citizen activists, the resident, non-citizen and citizen activists, to, to make the phone calls, to march, to turn out, to change the political conversation in the media and on social media. And when we do that, we're able to actually see change. Um, you know, we now have, we've been pushing, and not for that long, for just a year on a campaign to uh, ban face surveillance technology. It's insidious a technology that police use to track people, like they do in Wuhan, in, uh, not Wuhan, China, but in uh, Chengdu, China. Uh, and and it's, it's so pernicious. Well, now in Massachusetts, if you live in Springfield or Boston or Somerville or some of these places, they don't have it. Right, those people are free from that pernicious thing. We were able to change the reality by standing together, by building movements, by taking action from wherever we stand. So you don't have to be an ACLU lawyer or lawyers for civil rights lawyer or a, a CPCS lawyer to do this. Wherever you are right now, you can take action and be part of building this world. And so I actually leave you with like a very hopeful feeling because despite the fact that We'll have steps backwards to be sure I, I get heartbroken all the time. But we have hope is an act of courage and hope is a political act. And I think we have to make that political act and not only have hope, but have to stand by the words. And we, we've all been doing this work quite a long time. If we didn't have hope, we would have gone to do something else. Yeah. There you go. So, Lissy, uh, you're in charge of the questions because I don't see them. Uh, we now have about 27 minutes for questions, so. Thank you, and thank you, everyone. What a powerful conversation. There's a young woman who asked a question and took it down, but it's so, such a beautiful segue, Carol, from what you said. Her question was, I'm 18, what can I do other than vote? So I want to start there. What can our young people do to become active to take action during the aclu we have a huge <laughs> volunteer program and it's where you make calls to your legislature you send emails there's a social media component sometimes we have research projects so that's something you can do go to aclum.org um, and sign up and, and and you can put it on your resume uh, we don't have paid internships right now because of the uncertainties in the economy but we have lots of volunteer opportunities and then a couple of years after that you can go to law school <laughs> exactly. Anybody else? Uh, um, same thing, volunteer. Um, we, we have internships as well, unpaid, unfortunately, but there are so many more organizations doing critical social justice work. Um, and really, you can find your niche um, depending, you know, depending upon the organization, but there, there seems to be so many more organizations and opportunities than there were even 10 years ago and go to law school and then apply to be a Rappaport fellow. So I now see that I have the ability to let people ask their questions. Kevin Curtin, you have a question. I'm going to unmute you and hope this works. Kevin, are you here? I'm here, Lissy, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, so uh, the question, uh, I put it in the chat, is um, to some extent we've been talking a little bit about it, but uh, we've been talking about ways that the legislature can make change. Uh, as you know, lawyers and law students, we know that sometimes change comes through the courts as well. Uh, what are the areas you think where meaningful change uh, in, in, this, in the, when we're talking about racial equality in the law uh, may emerge through the courts?
wreck run. I want to have a whole campaign to wreck the Wren decision that says you can't take race into account. But it's like we have to like figure out ways to do that. I think that's one. I think qualified immunity is another place we've got to keep coming at them on qualified immunity, looking for good cases where the fact pattern's good and that, that we might be able to have a political win because, you know, I'd rather have a case with good facts and good law, right? Um, and so, you know, always trying to look for that. I think those are at least two big places um, and, and possibly trying around some of the surveillance stuff because uh, I think the court seems to have an interest in it and, and some of the, the Jones case and stuff about against CPS tra or GPS tracking and other stuff, building on that um, and the cell phone search cases, I think is another area in the courts that we have to continue to um, build uh, the jurisprudence of civil rights protection in the policing context. I think that those are all very good areas um, that have been flagged by Carol. Um, I would say that um, in addition to those uh, broader systemic or marquee issues that were just outlined, which we're fully on board with, I think it's also important to be bringing more run-of-the-mill cases. There are so many instances where people are being um, victimized by police just, just for living in their day-to-day -day life. We've received calls at Lawyers for Civil Rights, for example, of a black man who was walking his dog uh, by UMass, uh, Boston, in the green, right, right around there, where many people walk their dog. Well, a police officer um, uh, approached him saying, you cannot walk your dog here. And he's sitting there being like, look at all these other people walking their dog. Why am I not allowed to do that? And they're like, you cannot walk your dog here. I mean, those type of instances where police brutality, even though he didn't get beat up, right? Um, thank God, but that could have easily escalated. And even that interaction is brutality in and of itself to, to really harass and intimidate someone based on their identity and refuse them the basic activities that other people can do just based on their race, I think are things that are really concerning and that happen all the time. In light of George Floyd's murder, we've received so many of those phone calls and they might not be, you know, the sexy type of thing that, that people are thinking is gonna go up to the first circuit and make precedent. Um, but those are day-to-day -day indignities um, that are really important to counter. And I think that also makes a big dent in some of the cultural elements that we're talking about. And coupling that with damages requests for individuals so that it hits, like Carol was saying before, follow the money, right? If we make it expensive for police departments to discriminate, then we're gonna do less of it. If you can't be fair, at least be frugal, right? Is something that we could be requesting from, from these authorities and that could win potential taxpayer support even in communities that are not inclined to um, cry out Black Lives Matter. And so for me, it's, it's about combining some of these marquee issues that, that should be clarified through legal precedent and make their way to the First Circuit. Um, but it's also about making sure that we can do the day-to-day -day work on behalf of people whose civil rights have been violated. And so um, I think it's about doing both of that and hoping to build not just legal precedent, but community precedent in terms of how these things happen on the ground. This, I don't know, this is um, uh, maybe a little bit more uh, practical, but it gets to the cultural change that Yvonne uh, talked about earlier, but um, language matters. And I think uh, the court, as well as all of the different um, agencies that are involved in the legal system, um, the words that we use, um, that tends to dehumanize the people who are, are in court, who are caught up in the system, whether it's referring to someone who's locked up as an inmate, uh, whether when someone needs to be brought into court on a habeas corpus, it's moving the body, um, referring to someone as the defendant. Um, now, obviously that's a big, a big step from there to what happened to Mr. Floyd, but how did that, how did it get to a place where clearly that police officer did not see him as a human being. He was completely dehumanized. And so, but bringing it back to Massachusetts, there are so many examples of the dehumanization of people who get caught up in the system only because they have a mental illness. 
they have substance use problems. And, and that's something that I think can go a long way towards um, helping. So we have a question from Sue Farina, which is squarely on police training. Sue, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, you can ask your question. Okay, thank you. Um, my question relates to training in police culture. And well, first of all, thank you for a terrific program. I'm really enjoying hearing all your comments. When you were talking about some of what could possibly have changed to or been different to make the outcome of Mr. Floyd to be not so horrific, what has occurred to me is that I think fundamental changes to the way police are hired and trained have to happen. And I'd love to have your comments on that. And specifically, I'm looking at things like implicit bias training, the power of language used, and also the very fundamental purpose of the police. For instance, I've noticed that over time, uh, the police are referred to now as the police force oftentimes, instead of just a, a police department or even something as um, something like the community safety department. I might be dating myself, but I see police force all the time. And to me, that conveys something very different from what I grew up thinking the fundamental purpose of, of a, a police officer, or a member of the police department was. Um, and I see, I've seen the shift over time. So I, I I would love to hear your comments on how we can better hire, maybe with personality tests ahead of time, um, to detect certain aspects of a personality that may end up being problematic, um, implicit bias, um, language used, everything from top to bottom. I'd love to hear your comments on that. Yvonne has a lot more expertise on a lot of the policing stuff. Uh, than I do, but I love your comment about the importance of language and things like peace officer, right, rather than law you know, enforcement. And we've also changed um, from saying criminal justice to saying the criminal system or the criminal legal system. So thinking about language um, is really an important part of changing the public conversation and how we refer to people. So I'm really glad you raised that point. But I'll defer to Yvonne, who has a lot more expertise on the civil service police hiring, um, except to say maybe, Ivana, you know more than I do about this. I know that there's been a lot of, uh, because of the hiring preferences from people coming back from the wars, um, that there's a lot of uh, undiagnosed, perhaps, PTSD, and so real high rates of suicide among police. Um, and, and that's all sort of interrelated, but again, I'll defer to you on the, on the details. Thank you for flagging that, Caroline. You flatter me way too much. Um, the, uh, I, I think that's a really great question about training, and I, and I love, um, like Carol was saying, the, the language elements, but also your emphasis on hiring, because people think about training and they don't see it connected to actually the pipeline of, of recruiting, hiring, retaining, promoting, et cetera, right? It's all, all of this is connected in one continuum. And, uh, and if we're doing a bad job at training, that's one component, but it's connected to this broader, um, to this broader, uh, to this broader holistic issue of uh, of who's working there and how are they being trained. And so, um, like Carol flagged and, and alluded to, um, uh, the hiring process is is has really been the subject actually of significant litigation, uh, not just hiring but promotions uh, have also been. Um, the subject of significant litigation going up and down the First Circuit several times. Um, we are very active in this space because we want to create more opportunities for, for diversity in hiring, not just in the police department, but in fire departments, so across public safety agencies. Um, but the bottom line is that there really isn't any type of um, de-escalation training or uh, use of force training or unconscious bias training that is necessarily required or for that matter uniform among police departments. It really is a patchwork. So maybe in Boston, you, know, you have one particular training, which 
by the way, I hear is terrible based on our interactions with, with law enforcement officials who say that you basically just have a video that you just go and, and watch. I mean, it's not interactive. It's not dynamic. It's almost just like a checkbox. Oh, I went to do this uh, as opposed to being a meaningful and material aspect of your training as an officer. And so there are serious concerns about the quality of how officers are being trained on all of these issues, or I should say not being trained. Um, a component of a lot of the litigation that we bring against police departments is actually to professionalize and institute best practices around trainings for use of force, unconscious bias. And so um, that's been a key component of many of the settlement agreements that we have and uh, uh, we maintain a list of, um, of providers that we recommend for law enforcement agencies so that they can use actually quality um, uh, trainers and consultants in this arena. Um, but this is an area of, of serious concern. I mean, I think it also flows from the fact that just like Carol indicated, you know, you open up a nail salon and you need to be certified, but you're a cop and you don't. Well, it, by extension, uh, there is no type of ongoing professional training that you need to be able to maintain your job. So there is no um, best practices that are being followed or continued education that is being followed on a year-to-year -year basis. This is a huge gap. And for agencies that have such multi-million dollar budgets, you know, it's a drop in the bucket to dedicate just like one line item to professionalizing the work that your officers are doing through professional consultants and trainings. And so th this is certainly an area of concern and I agree it's a key one. Um, one other thing that just quickly to flag is that, um, and Carol alluded to it when she talked about the veterans, we have in Massachusetts a veterans preference for uh, public safety jobs, which means that a veteran will trump any other qualified applicant and you would exhaust the entire veteran list before you go to non-veterans. And so entire classes at BPD and other police departments are filled from just the veteran preference list because that's how many veterans are applying and, and denoting Massachusetts as their uh, top choice. There is no residency requirement, so you don't even have to be from Boston, but you could be leaving the armed forces and say, I want to move to Boston. And all of a sudden you jump to the top of the list instead of uh, hiring somebody who is, you know, born and bred here. And so this issue of veteran preference is, is also a concern um, in terms of how hiring gets done, not just because of the mental health um, uh, issues that Carol uh, rightfully flagged, but I think more systemically, as we talk about local and community-based policing, having a, um, a veteran from Louisiana who grew up in Louisiana his or her entire life comes off of the armed forces, designates Boston as the preference, and then gets the job over somebody raised in Roxbury or East Boston who knows the community, who has ties to the community, mm -hmm. I think is really problematic. And so this issue of how we hire and how we train continues to be a live issue in police departments across our commonwealth. Wow. Let's see, may I, may I interject one quick comment on the training to just kind of flag uh, a limitation that I see in training. Training helps with methodology, how you do your job as a police officer. Training does not change who the person is mm -hmm. who is doing the policing, which is, a critical mm -hmm. thing to look at when we're when we're thinking about what it is that people do on the street you know police officers have first amendment rights to join the different uh white supremacist groups i mean we've never made a connection between a police officer's views and his fitness his or her fitness for the job that they do so i just wanted to flag a limitation on this notion that we can train people to act appropriately and not with racist intent on the street because I don't believe that we have the capacity to do that with the training 
programs that are presently being used by the various police departments. We have a couple of questions about the nexus between prosecutors and police and the appropriate role of a district attorney. Go and ask the question. We had a big campaign called What a Difference a DA Makes. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a voter education campaign. Uh, it was part of what was going on across the country. This is what I talked earlier about the ACLU in all 50 states. So in Larry Krasner uh, in Philly, we lo looked at that campaign and we, it was a voter education campaign because we did a poll that showed that 86, eight out of 10 people didn't know the DAs are elected officials, right? They had no idea. And these are people who hold a huge amount of sway over the lives of people who fall into the criminal legal system. Um, we had a great debate here in, uh, in uh, Suffolk County. Uh, out at the House of Corrections, where we invited people who live in the House of Corrections to come forward, and they could, and, and there were half of them were the uh, men who are incarcerated there, and half were women. And they asked the best questions of all the various public forums we had, uh, public voter education, because they had the lived experience. They knew what prosecutors do, and they have a huge amount of control over people's lives on what they choose to charge, how they uh, uh, respond to things, and and so I think it's pretty interesting. Uh, at the end of this big voter education campaign, there are many people running, I'm trying to remember if it was five or seven, maybe Anthony or, or Yvonne remembers, but a lot of people ran. And then Rachel Rollins won, a black woman who'd been a public defender. Uh, you know, it, it, was, it was remarkable. And I, I think it really makes a difference. Um, now I'm thinking about a, a new campaign on what a difference, since we did What a Dam, which is what a difference a DA makes. You said, what a dam. Uh, we could do a, a, a same thing with sheriffs and call it what a sham, but it's just a thought for the future. So I have a question from a professor at BC Law, Alan Minuskin. I'm going to ask it to save time here. When you reimagine a system for local government's response to calls about troubling behavior in communities that may threaten public safety, what do you see? If we could erase the board and start over, what would you invent? I'll just share some quick thoughts. One is, I had a summer intern this, this past summer who, when we were talking about the Terrence Coleman case, he was shocked. He's from Vietnam. And in Vietnam, there's a number you call when you need the police to arrive. There's a different number you call when you need an ambulance. And never the two shall meet. And something like that just like blew his mind, the idea that we don't have a separate emergency service for people who just need medical support. I mean, something as simple as that, that, that happens in other countries, uh, even developing countries, apparently, but that we have not been able to get right. And so I think that, you know, this question immediately made me think about that example. But I, I think that we could probably identify many little interventions like this that could be huge. Um, I'll share one more. You know, we've been talking about school police. You know, I want to make sure that there are the least number of police interactions in a school as possible because we're in the business of disrupting the school to prison pipeline and lately the school to prison to deportation pipeline because they're all connected. Um, what about focusing on restorative justice, restorative justice principles to make sure that kids in particular can, can use an alternative methodology for how they are going through a grievance resolution. And so I'm sharing just these two quick examples because I think that this is not, you know, rocket science. It's very, it's very practical and, and very um, discreet solutions that we could really be implementing if we wanted to do something even just slightly different. It doesn't even have to take whole reform. Thomas Bridge, um, are you here? I'm going to Thomas Bridge. Stuart, are you Thomas Bridge? No, I, I am here. <laughs> Stuart is Stuart. <laughs> can, can you hear me? We can yes. hear you. Of uh, which question? Uh, the Voter Rights Act? 
You can ask either, make it quick. We're running okay, um, I just wondered if the panelists had any view of how best to protect voter rights in upcoming election. A uh, number of issues we've all seen, variable waiting times, precinct to precinct, availability of early voting, mail-in voting, and other issues. Uh, we've got very little time and, and a lot of challenge in front of us. Probably Carol's area of expertise, right? Yeah, and, and Yvonne's both. Uh, we work together yeah, on right, right. stuff. Uh, I would just say that um, I think the most important thing here in Massachusetts is to get your ballot, and if you're going to go by mail, to do it early, because there's I think there's a likely chance that election night itself will be accusations of not voting of ballots. And also, one of the most important things we did in the Voter Rights Coalition was to, the Voter Modernization Coalition, was to make sure that when we got the opportunity to vote by mail because of COVID, we also kept open the voting in person uh places so people have a choice uh and so this is you know i think the primary overall i think pr went pretty well um and, and we can learn some lessons from it uh as to how to make it work better in the general election um at the national level i think there's going to be unrest um no matter what happens and so i think there's going to be uh i think there's a, at least a, a a decent chance we'll be in a constitutional crisis of some kind or another and so i think it's important that we uh, right now begin to have a public education campaign where we tell people that they shouldn't be anticipating uh, that on election night uh, it's all going to be clear. I fully agree with that. I would just add one quick thing. If you're concerned about the health of our democracy and you want to do nonpartisan election protection, that's a campaign that we run with the ACLU, that we run with other community partners. And so we have already 100 volunteers. Our goal is 500. If you're interested in doing some poll watching, even from your car, from your bike, just to see if there are long lines or uh, to see what's going on, you know, is there a cop car stationed right by the entrance, which is causing, you know, intimidation, trepidation for people going in. Those are the type of things that when people, you know, report back to us, report to the hotline, that's huge. Uh, the hotline is 866-HOUR-VOTE and it's multilingual. And so we're looking for volunteers to help staff the, the helpline, the actual poll watching, social media monitoring. All of that is gonna be precisely for the reasons that Carol just explained, critical. Here's, here's one for everyone. How do we build coalitions for change and convince those who disagree with what has been discussed here today. It's an well, anonymous question. It's, um, it certainly seems like it's much harder to do that these days because um, everything is so polarized. You go on social media and it's just one extreme versus the other extreme. Um, and, and it starts at the top and that has, has pretty much set the tone. Uh, that being said, th that's the goal that we all should have is to communicate and to talk to people. Um, I, I'm biased, obviously, but I think we have the evidence on our side. Um, and I think you just need to talk to people and present uh, facts and data where, where it's available. And there is a lot of information available. Um, that may sound simplistic, but I really do think it, it gets to um, sitting and talking to your neighbors and friends and, and family. We all do it and try to get them to see um, that don't fall victim to the fear. Uh, I mean, that clearly is, I'm not saying everyone on the other side um, plays that game because they don't. Um, you know, you watch, the, we're probably not supposed to get political, but if you watch the RNC, um, it was all about fear. You know, you had people on there saying the Democrats are looking to destroy the suburbs. Um, and I'd like to think that if you had a conversation with people about something like that, they would, they would get it. That's a really good point, Anthony. Um, you know, the work in particularly in social justice movements tends to be very much coalitional, tends to be very much collaborative. And at the same time, it's not something that's taught in college or in law school. I think that would be a really good opportunity um, for, for teaching, for making sure that students are graduating, not just with the methods of coalition building, but with some of the practical realities of how hard it is to 
change hearts and minds and to bring people together at the table. Those are things that are hard to do and that, you know, Carol and Anthony and I do every day, but that doesn't necessarily, is, isn't necessarily intuitive. And that is something that I think if we had some academic formation would be, would be really useful in terms of um, giving folks a heads up because that's the work that they're expected to do and yet nobody really trains them on how to do that. And it's not easy, right? I mean, the three of us, we could easily find an issue that we have completely different points of view, but we know we need to get to a place where we can come together um, to move forward and, and make progress. So it's not easy, but it's, it's worth it in the end and, and it's fun. On that note, Jerry, I'm turning it back to you to end this. It is 5.01. It's been an amazing program. Well, I just want to say thank you to everybody. And I hope that the participants have come away from this very short uh, foray into a very deep and difficult question with at least some thoughts about what you're going to do tomorrow uh, about the, the, the mess that we find ourselves in. And uh, thank you to the Rappaport Center for allowing me to be a part of this. And thank you, Dean Rougeau, for supporting this and to the panelists. Yes, thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you so much, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye, -bye.